Bicycle Touring, Wikipedia Article Audio Bicycle touring means self-contained cycling trips for pleasure, adventure, and autonomy rather than sport, commuting, or exercise. Touring can range from single to multi-day trips, even years. Tours may be planned by the participant or organized by a holiday business, a club, or a charity as a fundraising venture. Historian James McGurn speaks of bets being taken in London in the 19th century for riders of hobby horses machines pushed by the feet rather than pedaled out speeding stage coaches. One practitioner beat a four-horse coach to Brighton by half an hour, he says. There are various accounts of 15- to 17-year-olds Drazien touring around France in the 1820s. On February 17, 1869 John Mayall, Charles Spencer and Rowley Turner rode from Trafalgar Square, London, to Brighton in 15 hours for 53 miles. The Times, which had sent a reporter to follow them in a coach and pair, reported an extraordinary velocipede feat. Three riders set off from Liverpool to London, a journey of three days and so more akin to modern cycle touring, in March that same year. A newspaper report said. Origins Social Significance Their bicycles caused no little astonishment on the way and the remarks passed by the natives were almost amusing. At some of the villages the boys clustered round the machines, and, where they could, caught hold of them and ran behind until they were tired out. Many inquiries were made as to the name of them queer horses, some called them whirligigs, menageries, and valparaisons. Between Wolverhampton and Birmingham, Attempts were made to upset the riders by throwing stones. Enthusiasm extended to other countries. The New York Times spoke of quantities of velocipedes flying like shuttles hither and thither. But while British interest had less frenzy than in the United States, it lasted longer. The expansion from a machine that had to be pushed or propelled through pedals on a small front wheel, made longer distances feasible. A rider calling himself a light dragoon told in 1870 or 1871 of a ride from Lewis to Salisbury, across southern England. The title of his book, Wheels and Woes, suggests a less than event free ride, but McGurn says it seems to have been a delightful adventure despite bad road surfaces, dust and lack of signposts. Journeys grew more adventurous. Thomas Stevens, a writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, set off around the world April 22, 1884 on a 50-inch Columbia with a money belt, a revolver, two shirts and a rain cape spending two years on the road and writing articles which became a two-volume 1,021 page book. John Foster Fraser and two friends set off round the world on safety bicycles in July 1896. He, Edward Lunn and F. H. Lowe rode 19,237 miles, through 17 countries, in two years and two months. By 1878, recreational cycling was enough established in Britain to lead to formation of the Bicycle Touring Club, later renamed Cyclists Touring Club. It is the oldest national tourism organization in the world. Members, like those of other clubs, often rode in uniform. The CTC appointed an official tailor. The uniform was a dark green Devonshire serge jacket, knickerbockers, and a Stanley helmet with a small peak. The color changed to grey when green proved impractical because it showed the dirt. Groups often rode with a bugler at their head to sound changes of direction or to bring the group to a halt. 
confusion could be caused when groups met and mistook each other's signals. Membership of the CTC inspired the Frenchman, Paul de Vivi, to found what became the Fédération Française de Cyclotourisme, the world's largest cycling association, and to coin the French word cyclotourism. The League of American Wheelmen in the U.S. was founded in Newport, Rhode Island on May 30, 1880. It shared an interest in leisure cycling with the administration of cycle racing. Membership peaked at 103,000 in 1898. The primary national bicycle touring organization in the U.S. is now Adventure Cycling Association. Adventure Cycling, then called Bike Centennial, organized a mass ride in 1976 from one side of the country to the other to mark the nation's 200th anniversary. The Bike Centennial route is still in use as the Transamerica Bicycle Trail. Development The first cyclists, often aristocratic or rich, flirted with the bicycle and then abandoned it for the new motor car. It was the lower middle class which profited from cycling and the liberation that it brought. The cyclist of August 13, 1892 said, The two sections of the community which form the majority of wheelmen are the great clerk class and the great shop assistant class. H. G. Wells described this aspirant class liberated through cycling. Three of his heroes in the history of Mr. Polly, Kipps, and the Wheels of Chance by Bicycles. The first two work in drapery shops. The third, Hoop Driver, goes on a cycling holiday. The authors Roderick Watson and Martin Gray say, Hoop Driver is certainly liberated by his machine. It affords him not only a country holiday, in itself a remarkable event which he enjoys immensely, however ignorant of the countryside he may be, but also a brush with a society girl, riding on pneumatics and wearing some kind of rational dress. Voyages The book suggests the new social mobility created by the bike which breaks the boundaries of Hoop Driver's world literally and figuratively. Hoop Driver sets off in a spirit of freedom, finally away from his job. Only those who toil six long days out of the seven, and all the year round, save for one brief glorious fortnight or ten days in the summer time, know the exquisite sensations of the first holiday morning. All the dreary, uninteresting routine drops from you suddenly, your chains fall about your feet, there were thrushes in the Richmond Road, and a lark on Putney Heath. The freshness of dew was in the air, dew or the relics of an overnight shower glittered on the leaves and grass, he wheeled his machine up Putney Hill, and his heart sang within him. Wells puts Hoop Driver in a new brown cycling suit to show the importance of the venture and the freedom on which he is embarking. Hoop Driver finds the bicycle raises his social standing, at least in his imagination, and he calls to himself as he rides that he's a bloomin' duke. The new woman that he pursues wears rational dress of a sort that scandalized society but made cycling much easier. The Rational Dress Society was founded in 1881 in London. It said, Types The Rational Dress Society protests, against crinolines or crinolettes of any kind as ugly and deforming, requires all to be dressed healthily, comfortably and beautifully, to seek what conduces to birth comfort and beauty in our dress as a duty to ourselves and each other. Touring Bike Both Hoop Driver and the young lady in grey, as he refers to her, are escaping social restraints through bicycle touring. Hoop Driver falls in love and rescues her from a lover who says marrying him is the only way that she, having left alone for a cycling holiday, can save her reputation. She lowers her social status, 
he raises his. McGurn says, the shift in social perspectives, as exemplified by Wells cyclists, led Galsworthy to claim, at a later date, that the bicycle had been responsible for more movement in manners and morals than anything since Charles II. Noted Bicycle Tourists The bicycle gained from the outdoor movement of the 1930s. The Cyclists Touring Club advertised a week's all-in tour, staying at hotels recommended by cyclists, for £3.10. The youth hostel movement started in Germany and spread abroad, and a cycling holiday staying at hostels in the 1930s could be had for £2. Roderick Watson and Martin Gray estimate there were 10 million bicycles in Britain to 1 million cars. A decline set in across Europe, particularly in Britain, when millions of servicemen returned from World War II having learned to drive. Trips away were now, for the increasing number who had won, by car. The decline in the United States came even sooner. McGurn says. In fiction. The story of interwar cycling was characterized by lack of interest and a steady decline. Cycling had lost out to the automobile, and to some extent to the new electric transport systems. In the 1930s cumbersome, fat-tired balloon bombers, bulbously streamlined in imitation of motorcycles or aeroplanes, appealed to American children, the only mass market still open to cycle manufacturers. Wartime austerity gave cycling a short reprieve in the industrial world. The post-war peace was to lay the bicycle low. However, between 1965 and 1975 the USA experienced a bike boom. In 1976, to celebrate the bicentennial of the founding of the United States, Greg Sippel, his wife, June, and Dan Liss Burden organized a mass bike ride, Bike Centennial, from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Sippel said, my original thought was to send out ads and flyers saying, show up at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco at 9 o'clock on June 1st with your bicycle. And then we were going to bicycle across the country. I pictured thousands of people, a sea of people with their bikes and packs all ready to go, and there would be old men and people with balloon tire bikes and Frenchmen who flew over just for this. Nobody would shoot a gun off or anything. At nine o'clock everybody would just start moving. It would be like this crowd of locusts crossing America. The ride eventually ran from Astoria, Oregon, to Yorktown, Virginia, site of the first British settlements, 4,100 Road, with 2,000 completing the entire route. It defined a new start for cycle touring in the United States and led to the creation of Adventure Cycling Association. Adventure Cycling has mapped routes across America and into Canada, many of the rides taking up to three months to complete on a loaded bicycle. In Britain, the Cyclists Touring Club grew to 70,000 members by 2011 and is now the biggest body campaigning for cycling and cyclists' rights in the UK. It continues to organise group touring events including day rides through its local groups and CTC holidays in many countries led by experienced CTC members. Since 1983, Sistrans has created a national cycle network of long-distance cycle routes including back roads and traffic-free tracks built, signed, and mapped in partnership with local organizations. Since 1980, there has been a growth of organized cycling holidays provided by commercial organizations in many countries. Some companies provide accommodation and route information to cyclists traveling independently, others focus on a group experience, including guides and support for a large number of riders cycling together.
A variation on this is holidays, often in exotic locations, organized in partnership with a charity, in which participants are expected to raise donation as well as cover their costs. The scale of bicycle touring and its economic effects are difficult to estimate, given the activity's informal nature. Market research indicates that in 2006 British cyclists spent £120 million on 450,000 organised cycling holidays, and a further 2.5 million people included some cycling activity in their annual holiday that year. The total economic benefit to communities visited during the nine-day-long Great Victorian bike ride was estimated at about $2 million in 2011, which does not include costs paid directly to ride organizers and ongoing benefits to towns. Sistrans estimate that the total value of cycle tourism in the UK in 1997 was £635 million and they forecast pound 14 bn for the whole EU by 2020. Among examples of current activity given by Sistrans are 1.5m cyclists using the 250 km Danube cycle route each year and 25% of holiday visitors in Germany using bicycles during their visit. The Bike Tour Mystery by Carolyn Keane, Nancy Drew Mystery Stories No. 168, The Wheels of Chance by H.G. Wells Bicycle touring can be of any distance and time. The French tourist Jacques Seurat speaks in lectures of how he felt proud riding round the world for five years until he met an Australian who had been on the road for 27 years. The German rider, Walter Stahl, lost his home and living in the Sudetenland in the aftermath of World War II, settled in Britain and set off from Essex on January 25, 1959, to cycle round the world. He rode through 159 countries in 18 years, denied only those with sealed borders. He paid his way by giving slide shows in seven languages. He gave 2,500 at 100 US dollars each. In 1974, he rode through Nigeria, Dahomey, Upper Volta, Ghana, Lyon, Ivory Coast, Liberia, and Guinea. He was robbed 231 times, wore out six bicycles and had five more stolen. Another German set off three years after Stahl and is still riding. Heinz Stuck left his job as a dye maker in North Rhine-Westphalia in 1962 when he was 22. He has never been home since. By 2006 he had cycled more than 539,000 kilometers and visited 192 countries. He pays his way by selling photographs to magazines. From Asia, Guo Dehao left China in May 1999 to ride across Siberia, the Middle East, Turkey, Western Europe. Scandinavia, then another 100,000 kilometers across Africa, Latin America, and Australia. But there are many who attempt long voyages in exceptionally short amounts of time. The current circumnavigation record by bicycle is just 91 days, 18 hours, by Mike Hall. Some distinguished writers have combined cycling with travel writing such as Dervla Murphy, who made her first documented journey in 1963, from London to India, on a single-speed bicycle with little more than a revolver and a change of underwear. In 2006, she described how, aged 74, she was held up at gunpoint and robbed while cycling in Russia. Eric Newby, Bettina Selby, and Anne Musto have all used cycling as a means to a literary end, valuing the way that cycling brings the traveler closer to people and places. Selby said. In more recent years, 
British adventurers Alastair Humphreys, Mark Beaumont, and Rob Lilwall have all been on epic bicycle expeditions and written popular books about their exploits. But most bicycle tourists are ordinary people out of the spotlight. One of the profound economic implications of bicycle use is that it liberates the user from oil consumption. The bicycle is an inexpensive, fast, healthy and environmentally friendly mode of transport. Ivan Illich stated that bicycle use extended the usable physical environment for people, while alternatives such as cars and motorways degraded and confined people's environment and mobility. Global players like Zetsitgo Bicycle Tours organize affordable and well-designed worldwide voyages globally ranging all types of challenging environment. Distances vary considerably. Depending on fitness, speed, and the number of stops, the rider usually covers between 50-150 km per day. A short tour over a few days may cover as little as 200 km and a long tour may go right across a country or around the world. There are many different types of bicycle touring. Cycle touring beyond the range of a day trip may need a bike capable of carrying heavy loads. Although many different bicycles can be used, specialist touring bikes are built to carry appropriate loads and to be ridden more comfortably over long distances. A typical bicycle would have a longer wheelbase for stability and heel clearance, frame fittings for front and rear pannier racks, additional water bottle mounts, frame fittings for front and rear mudguards slash fenders, a broader range of gearing to cope with the increased weight, and touring tires which are wider to provide more comfort on back roads. Ultralight tourers choose traditional road bicycles or Audax or Randon Noor bicycles for speed and simplicity. However, these bikes are harder to ride on unmade roads, which may limit route options. For some, the advantages of a recumbent bicycle are particularly relevant to touring. To lessen the weight carried on the bicycle, or increase luggage capacity, touring cyclists may use bicycle trailers. For a supported rider, luggage carrying is not important and a wider range of bicycle types may be suitable depending on the terrain. Examples of fictional works featuring bicycle tours include